What is going on guys? My name is John and welcome back to yet another video, as well as the first video of 2019. A big trend when the calendar rolls over is that people set resolutions or goals to promote having a better life for the next year. For this year, I would set two goals. The first one is to improve the quality of my videos, and the second one is something that I can actually say that I've completed already in the first week of the year. That's right, my lifelong dream of having just about the entire collection of US released Pokemon games for the PC is now complete. I know, it's like every Pokemon fan's biggest dream. And what's a better way to start off the new year than to show off my new collection? Today we're going to take a look at Pokemon games for Windows. I'm sure a lot of you right now are probably saying, I didn't even know there were Pokemon games released on the PC. And honestly, I don't blame you. A majority of the titles weren't really promoted that much, and I only have them because I basically lived on Cerebi's website as a kid and begged my parents to buy them for me. But there are some games in my collection that I haven't even tried or even remember, so today we're going to check most of them out and see how they compare to the console releases. I want to note that I'm only looking at games that were licensed by Nintendo. There are a ton of fan games, ROMs, and hacks of all kinds, but this list is only full of games that were backed by Nintendo. We're going to start these in chronological order, so let's begin with Pokemon Project Studio. Pokemon Project Studio was released on November 9th, 1999 and was Nintendo's first attempt at tapping into the PC market. Although these games are endorsed and improved by Nintendo, I don't think a single one of these is actually developed by them. But again, this also doesn't come as a surprise because they've made enough money that they can just outsource to other companies. On the box, it says it was developed by The Learning Company, who was basically the go-to group to make educational related games in the 90s and 2000s. Alright, with that out of the way, let's start it up. Oh. Because this game is 19 years old, it's pretty much expected that it won't run normally because of how Windows operating system has changed over the years. But after searching through hundreds of files on the install disk, I finally managed to get it to run. As expected, this really isn't a Pokemon game, but more of a Pokemon themed version of Microsoft Publisher. At the main menu, you have a choice of 14 different template styles you can use, but in each selection, you also have the option to start from scratch or choose a pre made template that was included on the disk. The possibilities are really endless. You can use this to make banners envelopes, condolence cards, you name it. Want an outdated calendar for the new year? Boom, print it out and scribble in a two and you're ready for the next year. Did you drop out of Harvard but don't want your parents to find out? Boom, big certificate for the fridge. Harvard, Princeton, Yale, we've got it. The image customization in this program is also top tier. You can put in pictures of Pokemon, add text boxes, use backgrounds, borders, drop shadows, outer glows, changing colors, tints. A lot of people ask me what program I use to make my thumbnails for my videos. Photoshop, GIMP, Microsoft Paint, Pokemon Project Studio. They even have all your favorite characters from the games and TV shows. Ash, Pikachu, Jesse, James, Star, Three Red Circles, and uh, Scared Ginger Boy. Hmm. I know what you're thinking. John, there has to be more. And you're right. I forgot to mention that this game is actually called Pokemon Project Studio Red version. That's right, there is also a blue version. Just like the main series games, these both have their own version exclusive Pokemon clip art. You only have 81 out of the 151 per game, but if you merge both copies, you're able to have access to them on one version. Or you can just go online and download your own images and import them yourself. This workaround also eliminates the need to go out and buy Pokemon Project Studio X and Y, Platinum, and XD Gale of Darkness if you haven't already. I think the funniest thing is that this program really gets confused when importing files. JPEG files aren't even supported, and PNG files aren't transparent and have really weird outlines to them. It's not really a surprise that this program hasn't aged very well, but for its time it was actually a pretty solid photo editor. Well, now that we finished this one, we can move on to the next one. PokéROMs Unlike the other games we're going to look at, this one had many different discs. PokéROM was a series of CD-ROMs made once again by the learning company in the very early 2000s. These discs came in the same packaging as most toys, but the thing that made it stand out was the disc. These CDs are about half the size of a regular one, and about a third of the storage size. For a better reference, they're about the same size as a GameCube disc. I'm sure this was to cut costs because of how little data actually needed to be on the disc, but what it didn't make sense was the fact that these discs were cut on both sides. I honestly have never seen any disc that has this style, and I can't really think of any reason as to why they did that. These came in waves, and the final wave was released around the time of the second Pokemon movie, which introduced some of the new Generation 2 Pokemon at the time. But rather than show you these pictures, I ordered one on eBay to see what this one's all about. Oh. So this one came completely destroyed unlike what it was listed as, but it only cost me $4 so I'm not really worried about it. Thankfully though I ordered another one, but this one is actually a sealed copy so we can check out all the stuff that comes in the packaging. I haven't got it in the mail so let's track it and see where it is. 
Just forget it. I don't care anymore. When you start playing the game, you choose a name and are given an option to choose your difficulty from grades 1 through 5. You then play one of those matching card games, but they're math related problems. After you spend all of 2 minutes completing that, you're already halfway done with the game. You now visit the sanctuary where you can do two things, the board game and the observatory. The board game is the main attraction. You start at the bottom of the board and every question you answer correctly lets you advance to the next space. The issue with this game is that there are only 10 spaces to advance on the board, and even for a kid this game would last at most a few minutes before you finished. To add on to that, the questions aren't even Pokemon related. You might get one in a blue moon, but they're basically the same questions that were asked in the matching game. Unlike that one though, you can play this with up to 4 players. Yeah, imagine that. 4 kids huddled around a keyboard trying to click the correct option before anyone else can. Riveting. The last section, the observatory, has some similar traits to the last game we talked about. You basically hover over the map and when your cursor lights up, you click on it to collect the Pokemon. That's it. But the more Pokeroms that you install on your PC, the more Pokemon that you can find and collect. Unfortunately, there isn't a way to get around this like we could with Pokemon Project Studio. You have to buy each disc to obtain them. At the time, the disc cost around $7, which means if you just wanted the first set, you'd have to pay $70 before tax, which is basically buying a copy of both red and blue at their original retail price. I think the worst part is that when they got around to gold and silver, they started releasing three disc packs for around $20, but the middle disc was flipped upside down. This one could have been one of 10 mystery discs that you could obtain, which, yes, means at minimum you'd have to spend at least $200 to get one of every disc, and the odds of you not getting a duplicate disc is extremely low. Well, that was a complete disaster, but now we can take a look at some real games. Let's check out Pokemon Masters Arena. This game was coincidentally released on January 1st of 2004, and we know the old saying, new year, new publisher. Step aside TLC because we've got a new company in town. This game was developed by Valuesoft, who was a sub-company of THQ that actually made video games, not educational ones. What, you've never heard of them? They're the creative minds behind great games like Extreme Trucker 2, Tabloid Tycoon, and Hunting Unlimited 2009. I mean, with a library of such extensive high-end AAA titles, I don't blame Nintendo for a second. I'll admit though, I am a bit worried about the packaging for the box. You will have hours of fun playing 8 challenging games. I'm not sure about hours of fun, but we'll see what this game has to offer. Why is the intro volume so loud for this game? I only have it set to 50% and I almost lost all of my hearing. And then the music just dies off immediately once we actually get into the game. They just hype the whole game up and then leave you in complete silence. So here we have 8 mini games like the jewel case said, and there really isn't an order we do them in, we just hop into whatever game we want to start playing and go for it. I think it was a nice touch that whenever you hover over one of the options, the name of the game completely covers up the Pokemon logo. It's something that would literally take 2 seconds to fix. I want to make sure that you all understand that these games are licensed by Nintendo. They asked this company to make this game, and they covered up the company's logo on the title screen of the game. This is pretty much the only place you get to see the Pokemon logo, which is a really rough start. But let's hop into the first game, which is Match a Pokemon Team. This one is just a matching Pokemon game. You click on the Pokeball, and it turns into a Pokemon, and then you match it up with the other one. This game, as well as the others, have 5 levels. One thing that's really consistent with all these games is the instructions you have before you start playing. There is a huge wall of text. I know this is a game meant for kids, but most of these games don't need an explanation. Up next is Why Not's Water Shots. This one just requires you to move the mouse up and down to control Waylord's tail to angle the launch of the Pokeball into the inner tube. Pretty straightforward. Following that we have Trico's Word Jumble. Now this one actually isn't that bad. You move the words around and the closer you get to spelling the Pokemon's name, the easier the Pokemon is to see. The only downside is that some of the Pokemon are almost impossible to make out at first. You can only make so many moves, so if you keep getting it wrong, you lose. Like what do you think this Pokemon is? Looks like a Golem, right? How about this one? It's Delcaddy. Like how would you even guess that? Well what about this one? This one isn't even a Pokemon, it's Exodia. See how hard they make this? Like I don't even- The next mini game out of the bunch is Mudkip's Bingo. You get a bunch of pictures of Pokemon and you have to match the description on the right. If you make a line out of the red chips, you go to the next round. Once again, this one really isn't that bad except for a few things. This game has complete evolution lines, and some of the questions apply to more than one Pokemon, but only one Pokemon is the correct answer. For example, virtually all of this Pokemon's body is its stomach. As a result, it can swallow something its own size. Now do you think the answer is Gulpin, or Swalot? Maybe I'm critiquing too hard, but they look like they both do the same thing. 
The other thing I wanted to mention is that when they ask you about evolutions, they consider basic Pokemon as first evolutions. So when they ask you to pick Kingdra, they ask you the question, what is Horsey's third evolution? I had to do a double take because I honestly had to consider for a split second if Horsey evolved somehow three times. Once again, this is something that is very small, but if you play the TCG enough, it stands out like a sore thumb. Up next is Pokemon Trivia Challenge. This is the only minigame out of them all that I don't have a single thing to point out. The questions are related to the games and TV shows, and they aren't extremely easy to answer like the rest. Each question is a level which makes it go by faster than pretty much every other game, but I was pleasantly surprised with this one. Now we have Pokeball Mystery Challenge. This one is really close to Mudkip's bingo, but in this one you have access to the entire alphabet to spell a Pokemon you see. Once again, they do the whole third evolution thing, but the really annoying thing is the triangle ring that you hear every time you select a correct letter. It's a long audio file, so when you click another, it just overlaps the other sound. Alright, let's just move on. Our seventh game is Spin as Mahjong. This is just Mahjong. Yeah. Pikachu's Picture Puzzle. Unfortunately, there isn't a lot to say, it's just a puzzle game. Like, literally, a puzzle game. One thing I noticed after recording this game is that right below the EXE file, there's an INI file that basically is the settings menu that should have actually been in the game. You can use this to skip the intro music, but the funny thing is that the audio in the game is defaulted to 75%. The fact that they had to turn the volume down in their own settings because the game was too loud really says a lot. This game is a lot better than the Pokeroms, but we still have one more group of games that we have to cover. Now the last group of games I can guarantee that you have never heard of, and if you have, I guarantee you've never played them or seen any gameplay of it. I'm talking about the Pokemon Purdue games. These games have arguably the most interesting story out of any game I can possibly think of. This collection of games released sometime in the summer of 2006 as a promotion for the 10th anniversary of Pokemon's release. I vividly remember this era of Pokemon, as advertising was literally everywhere to announce having over a decade of success. Now a lot of promotional stuff related to Pokemon over the years has been pretty straightforward. For Pokemon, you just download them over Wi-Fi, the trading cards are from going to movies or buying limited edition boxes, and the rest are usually just bonuses from buying other Pokemon related products. But these… these are really weird. If you look on the disc, you can see that it has a logo called Purdue. Now if you live outside the US, you've probably never heard of them. Purdue Farms is primarily a food processing company, and they mainly sell stuff like chicken, beef, and pork at your local supermarkets. These games came in three different versions, and had that same GameCube style disc. If you haven't put the pieces together yet, these games were included in the wrapping of their chicken breast packages. I'm not joking. They literally just slapped a disc in between some raw chicken and cellophane and said, alright Nintendo, let's make some money. And now you're probably wondering, why are these a thing? And that's a great question, I have no idea. Each one of these discs was available in the two or three breast chicken packages that you find at your local supermarket, and thankfully they were visible on the top so you know exactly which one you're getting. And how would I know this information? Well, I was one of those kids who dragged my mom to the store to go buy them. I have the complete set of them right here, and let me tell you, they are extremely hard to find. These discs are the one that I had as a kid, but I had to buy this one on eBay. Out of all the listings on the internet, I had three I could choose from. Two were around $30 for the green disc, and the last auction was for a complete set for a humble price of $1000. These games are so rare that this video is the second video ever on YouTube to talk about it. If you do a bit of research on these games, you'll find out that they actually produce 1 million copies total of these discs in the United States. Now that sounds like a lot, but let's consider a few things here. There are 50 states, and if you divide that by 1 million copies, you have 20,000 copies per state. That's a pretty rough example considering that some states may have received more or less because of the demand for chicken at the time, but you get the idea. 20,000 packages of chicken for a place like California or New York is astronomically low. If you took Maryland's population in 2006, which is the place where Purdue Farms is located, 20,000 packages of chicken was 0.35% of the population at that time. And I can guarantee that not all those people were Pokemon fans, so most copies were probably thrown out with the rest of the packaging. Another thing to consider is how short of a time these were on the shelves. Chicken is not exactly the most long-living food in the supermarket. In most cases, meats don't stay in a supermarket for longer than a week, and if they do, their price is extremely reduced. So this means that these games were available for at most 10 days. So one can assume that they had to be thrown out at the end or repurposed in some way. These games are without a doubt the rarest Pokemon games ever. And we're gonna take a look at them. Let's start out with... Seek and Find. When we get to the title screen, we actually have music this time, and we have four options. Playing the game, Pokedex, trading card game, and Pokemon Online. Let's just check out the main attraction first. 
this one is pretty self-explanatory. They ask you to find a specific Pokemon out of a pile of others. As you expect, this isn't difficult in the slightest. There are three levels that slightly increase in difficulty that you can choose from. The one thing that doesn't make any sense is that you can choose whether you want to play as Ash or May, which has zero impact on how you play the game. The Pokedex option is actually really good. They have full descriptions of each Pokemon, evolutions, and an advanced search option. Not exactly something you'd whip out if you were actually playing the game, but it's well done for what it is. Let's check out the trading card option. Learn to play demo. You can play a demo of the card game? No. You actually just watch 8 videos on how to play the game and can take a quiz at the end. Well, there has to be a prize for that, right? Yep, you get the prize of knowledge, something that no one can ever take from you. The last option is Pokemon Online. This just redirects to the Pokemon's website, which comes up with an unavailable page. Alright, well let's check out the next one, Pokeball Launcher. This one obviously has the same menu as the last one, so let's just play the game. So, what do I do? Apparently you just have to press spacebar to receive a Pokeball, and then throw it at the Pokemon to catch it. If you catch 10, you win. But you have to be careful as you have a limit for how many you can throw. Only two left? More like 2,000. This whole game is broken. The only way you can lose is by closing out of the game. Let's move on. The last game out of the bunch is Team Rocket Blast Off. Here you play as Ash and May, even though you can only select one player, and you try to save your Pokemon that Team Rocket is sacrificing off their balloon. If you fill up the meter on the left, you win, but if you catch a sandbag, you lose points. I'm not sure what's better, the fact that they just ripped a background from the anime, or that most of the text was made in Microsoft Paint. Okay, so I guess my collection of Pokemon games for the PC aren't as cool as I thought they were. Most of the games on the list were shovelware that were used to make a quick buck, or they're just so outdated that they don't work as well as they used to. Now, I don't recommend getting any of these games, but there is one more game that I did forget to mention. In the next video, we're going to take a look at Pokemon Play It. And that's going to do it for today's video. If you liked the video, leave a like because I'll be making more content soon. If you have any suggestions for videos you'd like to see, leave a comment below. I want to thank you all for the amazing support last year, and I'm really excited to bring a bunch of new videos for you over the course of the next year. Subscribe and ring the bell if you haven't already to keep updated with the newest videos. Other than that, I'd like to thank you all for watching, and I'll catch you on the next one.